afternoon, everyone. And the first item of business today is consideration of business motion 10095 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revision to the business programme for today. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10095. Minister. Moved, presiding officer. Thank you very much. As it appears that no member has asked to speak against the motion, I will now put the question to the Chamber. And the question is that motion number 10095, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. And we now move to the next item of business, which is portfolio questions. Uh, and portfolio questions today are on Commonwealth Games, Sport, Equalities and Pensioners' Right. Question 1, Kenny Gibson. To ask the Scottish Government on what basis it considers a Scottish Pensioners Parliament could be established. Cabinet Secretary Shona Robeson. The Scottish Government does not have any current proposals to establish a Pensioners Parliament. Instead, we are supporting the Scottish Older People's Assembly with funding of over £100,000 for the period 2012 to 15. The Scottish Older People's Assembly enables older people to have their voices heard and influence policy and practice on the wide range of issues that affect them. Kenny Gibson. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Cabinet Secretary, for that reply. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe, though, that uh, a pensioners' parliament or indeed assembly would be an excellent, uh, an excellent forum to discuss many issues of importance to older people, such as, for example, uh, the, the retirement age and uh, the level of state pension, perhaps even in independent Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. Um, what I can say to the member is that the Scottish uh, Older People's Assembly uh, has discussed uh, the retirement age of state pension and, and many other issues uh, since uh, its establishment. And uh, this year's assembly is due to be held on the 31st of October within uh, this parliament. And uh, they are looking at a number of issues, and I'm sure pensions will be one of them, in addition to, uh, in particular, the Community Empowerment Scotland Bill. Uh, I think it's important to note that the Older People's Assembly has uh, done a, a lot to reach out to older people across the whole of Scotland and is made up from older people's groups uh, across the country and also has representation from across the various equality communities. So I think it is uh, a good organisation that represents uh, older people and gives them a voice. And uh, I was very happy to meet with them uh, uh, last month on the 24th of April, and we had a very constructive discussion across a number of issues. Thanks. Question two, Margaret McCulloch. To ask the Scottish Government what further information it plans to publish on proposals for pensioners' rights in an independent Scotland before the referendum. Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government paper Pensions in an Independent Scotland has already set out detailed proposals on pensions. Following a vote for independence, the best of the existing state pension system would be retained in introducing genuine improvements where necessary. Private pension saving would be supported. The legislative and regulatory framework would provide strong protection for individuals' private pension savings and a public service pension system would be delivered that is affordable, sustainable and fair. The paper also showed how successive UK governments had failed to protect the pension system and pensioners over recent decades. This has led to a crisis whereby 13.2 million people, according to the latest Department for Work and Pension Statistics, are under-saving for their retirement in the UK. This government believes that an independent Scotland can do better and will continue to make these arguments in the coming months. Margaret McCulloch. The ICAS report, Have Our Questions Been Answered, concludes that without changes to EU rules on the funding of defined benefit pension schemes, employers would need to make good any deficits held by new cross-border schemes. Given we now know EU rules are not going to change, what evidence can the Minister produce to demonstrate that the most basic rights of pensioners, the right to their pension, will be any safer with independence than with the pooling and sharing of resources across the United Kingdom. Cabinet Secretary. Well, as I said, Scotland's future sets out our proposals for an affordable, fair and efficient pension system in an independent Scotland. And we considered in detail the impact of EU rules on defined benefit pension schemes that currently operate in Scotland and, of course, in the rest of the UK. 
uh, and if, if they continue to operate on, on independence on a cross-border basis. We clearly set out our view informed by practice in Ireland under the current regime that a scheme which became cross-border and independent should be allowed to implement its existing recovery plan in accordance with the period originally set for it rather than having to achieve full funding over a much shorter timescale. This remains the case regardless of the Commission's decision to defer plans to encourage the growth of cross-border schemes by relaxing the funding regime. It is yet another issue, however, that we are keen to talk to the UK Government about in advance uh, of the yes vote in September. It's just a pity the UK government isn't willing to do so as well. Bob Doris. Thank you, President Officer. President Officer, pensioners should absolutely know what their rights are, so therefore does the Cabinet Secretary agree with you that Labour must now come clean, publish its Cuts Commission report and tell pensioners whether under Labour they will still have the right to free prescriptions, to concession to travel or to free personal nursing care? Because right now it looks as like if Labour will axe the lot. Cabinet Secretary. Well, I, I agree with the member that we should know uh, from Labour what uh, is in store with their Cuts Commission. There are many really important policies that protect pensioners and others uh, who are vulnerable within our society, which are held dear and which this Parliament uh, should, should be proud of having uh, passed uh, into to law. Uh, I just hope that... Uh, that we see uh, what the Cuts Commission has in store soon, so that people can consider that as they make their minds up about how to vote on the 18th of September. Many thanks. I should have reminded the Chamber that short questions and answers will be appreciated. Question three, Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government what the position is of the Cabinet Secretary with responsibility for equalities on the implications on equalities of the findings of the Education Scotland report Making Sense, Education for Children and Young People with Dyslexia. Many thanks. Uh, Cabinet Secretary. The Scottish Government's Equality Outcomes Report stated that we will identify areas for improvement where children and young people with protected characteristics are not gaining awards in school education and identify where children and young people with protected characteristics have high levels of success in gaining awards. A number of the findings of the report have implications for equality, for example, the inequity in qualifications attained by young people with dyslexia compared to their peers. The report was carried out with the engagement of parents and children and young people with dyslexia. The Scottish Government will make a formal response to the report within four to six weeks, outlining the steps it will be taking to address its recommendations. Thank you. Claudia Beamish. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer and for highlighting the relationship with the protected characteristics, which is obviously of importance. Um, taking into account the geographical discrepancies highlighted in the new report on dyslexia, can the Minister tell us if the Scottish Government will consider publishing guidelines so as to ensure more consistency across local authorities where some don't even have a definition of dyslexia and would also encourage the support of the toolkit in schools? Cabinet Secretary. Um, well, I'm glad the member mentioned the toolkit because uh, I understand that that has been very well received uh, to help teachers address the needs of pupils uh, with dyslexia. And of course, it was the Minister for Learning Science and Scotland's Languages that launched uh, that uh, toolkit uh, in September 2012. I, I think the member makes a, a good point about guidance and about geography. And I'm certainly happy to speak to the Minister for Learning Science and Scotland's Languages to uh, suggest that he takes that forward. And I'm sure he'll be in touch with the member with more detail about that. Many thanks. Question four, Gil Patterson. Yeah, thanks, uh, President Officer. To ask the Scottish Government how pensioners' rights would be protected in an independent Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Pensions in a, an independent Scotland set out that if elected as the first government of an independent Scotland, this government would retain the best of the existing pension system while introducing a range of key improvements to protect and enhance pensioners' interests. These include for the state pension, uprating by the triple lock for at least the period of the first independent parliament, providing protection for the value of pensions over time. Introducing the single tier pension in 2016 at a starting level of £160 per week, the UK parties have currently failed to say what the level will be under them. Uh, retaining the savings credit element of pension credit, thereby benefiting around 9,000 pensioners on low incomes. It's worth adding that we already have a strong record in protecting older citizens through, for example, the provision of concessionary travel and freezing council tax for pensioners. With the full powers of independence, we will be able to develop the support still further. Thank you. Gail Patterson. Uh, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for that answer? And I wonder if she agrees with me 
Proposal put forward by the UK Government to raise the age of retirement are leading to real concerns that a number of people in Scotland will not live long enough to receive a pension due to their lower life expectancy. And I wonder, I, I wonder if she agrees with me further that it's only with independence that pensioners' systems suited to the interests and lives of the people of this country can be created. Well, can I thank the, the, the member for his uh, question? Uh, and of course, we have set out that uh, uh, an independent commission, an expert commission, will look at the appropriate age of, of the state pension age in Scotland, taking into account issues of fairness, equality and affordability. It is worth noting that uh, the, the, the public, the Scottish public, believe very clearly that, uh, that it ought to be this parliament that makes the decisions for Scotland about the state pension. Uh, in the most recent Scottish Social Attitude Survey, 65% said that this Scottish Parliament should make those decisions. Only 33% said West Westminster. I think that speaks volumes. Many thanks. Question five, Liz Smith. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the number of tickets made available for Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games to people who live in Scotland. Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I perhaps, uh, with the, the Deputy Presiding Officer's um, very quick indulgement, uh, just say uh, that uh, the tickets um, have gone back on sale this morning, and I'm pleased to say that the enthusiasm for the Games remains as big as ever. The performance of the ticketing website and hotline has been steady, and thousands of individuals and families have today secured tickets for what I believe will be the greatest Games ever. Um, in answer to the member's question, the Commonwealth Games Federation Coordination Commission's final inspection in March concluded that the Glasgow 2014 Commonwealth Games are shaping up to be the best ever. I'm delighted with the fantastic response uh, from the public for tickets. Over 94% of available tickets were sold in the initial phases. 57% of those were bought in Scotland, ensuring that there will be a fantastic home support as Team Scotland goes for gold this summer. Uh, thank you, and it is certainly good news that uh, today went without any hitches. Uh, could I ask at what stage the Scottish Government will be able to provide a full breakdown of ticket sales and how many have been purchased by people living in Scotland, by those in the rest of the UK and by those from abroad? Uh, well, I, I can tell you uh, at the moment that 57% of those uh, tickets sold so far were, were bought uh, in, in Scotland. Obviously, as we get to the final tickets being sold, we will be able to look at whether that percentage has changed in any way. I think the, the short answer to the member is once all the tickets have been sold and we're in a position to reflect on the analysis of, of uh, who bought tickets from where, and I can make sure that Parliament's furnished with that information at the appropriate stage. Many thanks. Uh, Gavin Brown. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, to ask the Scottish Government what further research it plans to carry out on the relationship between the state pension and life expectancy. Cabinet Secretary. Pensions in a, an independent Scotland sets out that following a vote for independence, this government re reserved judgment on the rapid increase in the state pension age to 67. The analysis published last week provide, provided new evidence as to why our position makes sense. Scots on average receive £10,000 for men and £11,000 for women less in state pension over a lifetime than the UK average. For men and for women in Glasgow, compared to the best life expectancies in the areas in the UK, the pension gap is 50,000 and 46,000 respectively. Increasing the state age pension to 67 so quickly, based on UK rather than Scottish levels of life expectancy, compounds this unfairness. As the pensions paper set out, detailed considerations of whether the state pension age should increase to 67 for Scotland would fall to an independent commission. And it's this body that would be responsible for, for conducting further research on life expectancy and pensions, taking affordability and fairness into account in drafting its recommendations. The Commission would report to an independent Scottish Parliament within its first two years, enabling Parliament to make a fully informed decision on what is fair and affordable for Scotland. Gavin Brown. Given what the Minister said about the current gap, why does Shona Robeson support the increase to 66 by 2020? Well, we have um, looked at the affordability of the current position. 
Obviously, uh, we have to make sure that our pensions position uh, in an independent Scotland is affordable, and that is why we have accepted the, the increase of the state pension age to 66. However, we do believe that there is an opportunity, given the lead-in time, uh, to look very, uh, very closely indeed at whether the, pe the state pension age should ri rise to 67, because that will compound what is an already uh, unfair position here in Scotland. And I think we have to take very seriously the position, not least that of women, uh, who will uh, be particularly affected, and those living in our poorest communities whose life expectancy is uh, lower, or although life expectancy is improving in Scotland, it's improving less quickly than the rest of the UK. So we are very cautious about compounding that position by raising the, the state pension age to 67. And that's why the expert commission will look at fairness and affordability in coming to its conclusions. I would hope that's something that members across this chamber could support. Thank you. Question seven, Mark Ubiagi. To ask the Scottish Government what impact the opening of Pride House in Glasgow will have on LGBT people. General Robinson. The Scottish Government hopes that Pride House will have a significant impact on LGBT people, both in Scotland and beyond, by recognising and celebrating the advances made towards equality for lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender people and the contribution this diverse community makes to society. Pride House will promote the visibility, inclusion and participation of LGBT people, both in sport and in society more generally. As one of the recently announced uh, patrons of Pride House, can I commend the Cabinet Secretary, one of the other recently announced patrons, uh, for that answer. Uh, in my constituency, we've got a, a great number of LGBT-oriented sports clubs, the Thebans, the wonderfully named Hot Scots, and the Edinburgh Frontrunners. But broadly, homophobia in sport is still a, a major obstacle that has been identified, and there are concerns that obviously there are there, it would be very easy to say job done now that equal marriage has been legislated for. So I would ask the Cabinet Secretary, what action does she see being taken to tackle homophobia in sport in the coming months and years, and what will the Scottish Government be doing more broadly in this area? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, can I also uh, say to uh, Marco Biagio that I'm pleased to, to be a, a patron. I think Pride House will be a fantastic uh, element of, of the Games, uh, providing a, a great uh, atmosphere, uh, but also some important messages uh, about equality during uh, Games time. Uh, I would refer the, the member to um, the recommendations from Out for Sport. We very much welcome the Equality Network's report, which we're using as a, a basis to explore the effectiveness of our current approach uh, in sport. Uh, I'm aware of the work that has taken place in developing a Scottish LGBT sports charter and believe that this will positively contribute to increased inclusion participation and involvement of LGBT people in sport and I know that Sport Scotland have been working very closely with uh, governing bodies and clubs to make sure that barriers are removed um, for, for everyone who wants to take part in sport and hopefully that will be yet another legacy of the Commonwealth Games this summer. Thank you. Question 8, Hugh Henry. To ask the Scottish Government in light of recent comments by the Cabinet Secretary with responsibility for pensioners' rights what the retirement age for pension eligibility would be if Scotland separates from the rest of the UK. Cabinet Secretary. As I've already stated, this government reserves judgment on the rapid increase in state pension age to 67 as planned by the UK government. And that's why we'll establish an independent commission to consider this matter, and in particular, what is affordable and fair for Scotland. We believe that Scotland should have the full powers to develop a system that's in line with Scottish needs and circumstances. As the recent analysis on life expectancy has shown, these circumstances are different from those in the UK as a whole, on which current UK pension age plans are based. We're not alone in our belief that varying levels of life expectancy demand a rethink in these plans. For example, a TUC report published in August last year stated increasing state pension age is unjust because of the persistence of inequalities in life expectancy between different groups. Thank you, Henry. Uh, President Officer, in light of that response and the one given earlier to Gil Patterson, can I ask the Minister or the Cabinet Secretary if she will guarantee that there will be no increase in pension age beyond 66 uh, if Scotland separates from the UK? And if she cannot give that guarantee, will she then tell us, in fact, that it means that the pension age might well rise beyond the age of 66? Uh, well, 
Uh, first of all, I, it's a very curious question from the member, given that in Labour's 2010 election manifesto, they proposed an increase to 67 in 2036. So I'm surprised that Hugh Henry is now towing the Tory line by accelerating, by accelerating that change to 2026. I've made it very clear in my original answer that what we will do is to set up an independent commission to look at what is affordable and fair for Scotland. That uh, commission will then report to this Parliament, where all members across we'll all the chamber will hear both the questions and answers. Make a decision on what is best and what is affordable and fair for Scotland. I can't see any reasonable person to Mr. Henry. That. Thank you very much. And we now move to training youth and work employment questions. Question one, Neil Bibby. To ask the Scottish Government how many women with children under the age of five are seeking employment. Cabinet Secretary Angela Constance. Presiding officer, the monthly unemployment figures do not break down to that level of detail. But we do know from a range of international evidence, including the OECD's 2011 report, Doing Better for Families, that childcare is the key factor in helping women into work. And we also know that the number of women in work has risen uh, by 38,000 over the last year, a 1.7 percentage points increase. So that's real progress, presiding officer, and with the massive expansion in childcare uh, commencing this August, we hope we will see even more progress as a result of this government's commitment to getting more women uh, the jobs that they need. Thank you. Neil Bibby. Um, the SNP's white paper childcare policies have been completely discredited by the SPICE analysis, showing there would be tens of thousands of missing mums with young children for the policies to be self-funding. If the Cabinet Secretary disputes this, will the Cabinet Secretary confirm economic modelling has been done specifically on the childcare policies? And will she confirm that the Government has refused to publish this under FOI? Will she, in the interest of an informed debate, publish that economic modelling? Cabinet Secretary. Thank you, President Officer. I think the, the real issue here is that Mr Bibby uh, either doesn't understand or deliberately misunderstands the transformational uh, nature of the childcare policies proposed by this government. Because, as even acknowledged by the, the Spice paper, um, we are not just talking about those parents who currently have children under the age of five. And we all know, again published, uh, a fact agreed by Spice, that there are 55,000 births uh, a year in Scotland. So our policies won't just impact on those who currently have very small children but will have a year-on-year -year impact. Because very, it's very important also to acknowledge, presiding officer, that the gender gap in employment continues even as children go to school. And even with children uh, between the ages of uh, 12 to 18, there's an 8% uh, employment gap, and that's something that we want to address. Um, women are lost to the labour market. Mr. And Bibby. it's those women that we want to be given uh, real opportunity and real choice. And as, of course, the members are well aware, government is quite well within its right uh, to commission all sorts of advice uh, when we are pursuing and developing policies. Thank you. Thank you. Supplementary, Sandra White. Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. And I welcome the, the fact that 38,000 more women are in employment than they were a year ago. And despite what uh, Neil Bibby says, would uh, the Cabinet Secretary agree with me that childcare proposals outlined in Scotland's future will help many more women back into work? Briefly, yeah, yeah. Cabinet Secretary. Yes, indeed. And uh, the labour market statistics are very encouraging for women. Um, and the, in terms of labour market statistics, uh, women in Scotland are outperforming uh, the statistics elsewhere in the UK. We have lower female unemployment, higher female employment and lower uh, female inactivity. But of course, this government acknowledges uh, that there is much, much more to do and that we've always got to really search beneath those uh, headline statistics to get the real story because while uh, the headline employment indicators for women are improvement uh, there are many issues that are very real to women the length and breadth of this, this country in terms of the type of work uh, that they are obtaining which of course is reflected in pay levels. Jenny Mara. The Cabinet Secretary is so committed to this very important issue. Will she publish the economic analysis that Mr Bibby has asked for and that your policy is predicated on? Well, uh, with respect, uh, President Officer, I answered Mr Bibby's question very straightly and very fairly and said that governments are all governments 
this one and previous administrations are well within their rights to uh, gather information uh, in the course of developing uh, policies and future plans. And I believe there's a freedom of information request uh, submitted uh, and that will be uh, considered in the appropriate manner by the appropriate people. Many thanks. Question two, Linda Fabiani. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government what role early intervention has in tackling the long-term unemployment of women. Right. So, officer, Scottish ministers believe that early intervention is key to preventing long-term unemployment. Uh, that's why we have detailed in Scotland's future our plan for employment services in an independent Scotland to be built on the principle of early intervention and to seek to prevent individuals from becoming long-term unemployed. Uh, so an early assessment of need can provide support when required uh, rather than after nine or ten months as happens under the current system. Many thanks. Uh, Linda Fabiani. Uh, I'd like to thank the Minister for that, um, that response. And um, bearing in mind that we all know there's a skills gap in science and engineering and particularly for women, uh, would she agree that the initiative that was taken yesterday by East Kilbride Group Training Association to have a girls into engineering open day does provide a way of having early intervention in terms of school girls choosing the subjects that will enable them to move into modern apprenticeships and further careers in engineering and is this something she would consider um, as an initiative moving forward for government. Thank you very much. Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, indeed. Um, I'm certainly open to hearing about a range of initiatives uh, and proposals, particularly uh, with a view to increasing the proportion uh, of girls who will pursue uh, either training or careers in STEM-related subjects. Uh, it's very good to hear of that specific uh, initiative, uh, having a, a very targeted open day uh, towards encouraging young girls to pursue an uh, engineering uh, careers and it reminds me uh, of the point that we should never fail to make that um, addressing uh, inequality in the labour market isn't just the right thing to do but it's actually the smart thing to do in terms of tapping all the talents of the entire population and to help business address issues uh, such as the skills gap and it's very important uh, also to acknowledge uh, presiding officer that this week is Scottish uh, Apprenticeship Week. Thank you. Mary Scanlon. Uh, thank you. Since 2011, the number of males not in education, employment and training has fallen by 4,000, which is very welcome. But the number of females in the same category between the ages of 16 and 19 has risen by 1,000. Can the Cabinet Secretary explain why? The not in education, employment and training figures are always uh, very interesting and it is important uh, to recognise uh, that uh, over the past year that we've actually seen an overall decrease uh, in those figures um, of four or five thousand and I think that's very important uh, to acknowledge that. For the first time in quite a few years, um, the uh, not in education, employment training figure is below uh, 30,000. Um, it is not unusual to see a fluctuation of around a thousand in either gender um, but what is interesting is that for the first time we're actually seeing a levelling uh, between the sexes in, in terms of that uh, particular statistic and the norm is usually that boys uh, out, outnumber, outnumber women so we have to go away and have a proper look at that uh, we may of course be having some success um, with boys between that ages but we most certainly would not want that to be at the expense um, of girls uh, creeping up uh, in exclusion Thank you. Reminding the Chamber again, brief questions and answers would be welcome. Question three, Chick Brodie. Thank you, Presiding Officer. To ask the Scottish Government for what reason it has set the target of 40% of women on the board of companies in the event of independence. That's secretary. Women's representation in all areas of Scottish life is a priority uh, for this government and as a government we are leading uh, by example with 40% of Cabinet now women. Uh, currently a consultation on 40% minimum targets for gender quotas on public boards is underway. Uh, the government also believes increased diversity is good for business and will give due consideration to the position on company boards uh, working with businesses once we have control of all the required powers post-independence. Thank you. Jack Brody. Uh, I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her answer. Will she agree that the target of 40% should not be adopted or accepted as a norm? And will she accept that 
by providing appropriate support facilities to women and by creating a level playing field for women and indeed minorities, that all appointments to boards should be based then only on ability and merit. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. President Officer, I don't see um, increasing the uh, proportion of women on boards and appointing on merit as uh, mutually uh, exclusive. Our position uh, of this government is that at least 40% uh, uh, of uh, representation should be uh, by, by women. We think that's very important. And there are very good business reasons as to why we want to see uh, more women on, board, on boards. Um, and we, of course, are very concerned that um, at UK level, uh, that we, we may not meet the 2015 targets of 25% uh, of women on boards. Progress seems to have uh, stalled. But there's very important research that boards with women uh, outperform, outperform boards uh, that uh, do not have uh, gender balance. So again, it shows that addressing issues of inequality and promoting equality isn't just the right thing to do, but it's a good thing to do for business. Many thanks. Question four, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. Can I ask the Scottish Government what its position is on the role of massive open online courses in improving the employment prospects of women and young people? Secretary. The Scottish Government recognises the contribution that massive open online courses or MOOCs uh, can make to the development of uh, knowledge and skills and to improving the employability of a wide range of people. Uh, MOOCs may be of particular benefit to women and young people, for example, where working <coughs> patterns caring responsibilities or financial constraints make travel to a college or university campus uh, a barrier to learning. Yep, Patrick Harvey. Thank you. I, I agree that the ability to access free or nearly free educational content uh, at a time of the individual's choosing can be a, a real benefit. But there's, uh, there's a clear evidence growing, I think, that MOOCs have the greatest benefit in terms of throughput to formal education or uh, greater employment prospects when there is actual course credit available and also where there's some degree of real world connection between students and that could be uh, provided at a community level it doesn't have to come through educational institutions i wonder if the government could look further at this uh, and talk to the, the various agencies that could provide that support uh, to people women young people and others uh, who could gain greater benefit from the abil ability to access uh, online I think we get the content. point, Mr Harvey. Thank you. When the Cabinet Secretary? Uh, yes, I uh, agree with uh, Mr Harvey's uh, comments. Uh, MOOCs are important in terms of the overall journey. Um, it is important that where opportunities can be to accredit learning, uh, that's important. And that they don't necessarily replace uh, more formalised learning, but they do can, can also uh, enhance it. Mr Harvey may be interested to, to note that the, the Scottish Funding Council uh, will be investing £1.3 million um, over three years uh, really to look at best practice uh, in this area and in particular to uh, develop uh, better peer support uh, awareness raising and I'm sure we could feed in his comments about accreditation to that. Thanks. Question five, Graham Day. Thank you. To ask the Scottish Government what importance it places on modern apprenticeships in engineering. Cabinet Secretary. Engineering is an important sector for Scotland with the potential to make a significant contribution to economic growth with the latest Office of National Statistics survey showing that over 56,000 people uh, are working directly in Scotland's engineering and allied industries sector. Uh, as such, it is critical that we develop the necessary skills for a future engineering workforce and one way we can achieve this is through the Modern Apprenticeship Programme. And between April and December 2013, there had been 1,665 MA starts, uh, with uh, 5,522 MAs currently in training on engineering-related frameworks. Thanks. Graeme Day. I thank the Cabinet Secretary for the answer. The Angus Training Group in my constituency have just confirmed that they will have a full complement of 75 engineering apprentices for the year commencing August 2014. Indeed, had space at the Arbroath premises allowed, they could take on another 15 young people would the Cabinet Secretary agree that this demonstrates not only that youngsters are keen to get into this field, but that as 54 of these trainees are involved with oil and gas companies, the doom and gloom spread by Better Together about the future of Scotland's offshore energy industry could not be wider of the mark? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, yes, presiding officer, there are, of course, our jobs in oil and gas, and that's a very uh, important message for young people, and by that I mean young women and young men, um, the length and breadth of Scotland, and not just in the uh, Angus uh, area. Uh, there are, of course, uh, 24 billion barrels of uh, recoverable uh, oil and gas uh, in our uh, sea. Um, I'm particularly uh, glad to hear of the success of the Angus Training Council, uh, given that it's Scottish Apprenticeship Week, and I hope that they can resolve uh, their accommodation issues uh, and get up to uh, 90 uh, apprenticeships starts that would be particularly welcome. Excellent. Question six, Richard Simpson. To ask the Scottish Government what steps it is taking to reduce the level of gender segregation in certain industries. Secretary. The Scottish Government is working to address gender segregation through its strategic approach and allocation of funding to equate Scotland, close the gap and career-wise of £1.5 million uh, for 2012 to 15. Uh, the Occupational Segregation Cross Directorate Working Group is driving this work forward, uh, reporting to the Strategic Group on Women and Work, which I chair. Uh, reducing gender segregation requires a, a life-stage approach, uh, which breaks down barriers throughout education and training. Uh, for example, the group recently discussed work being undertaken to improve the gender balance uh, on modern apprenticeships and other programmes uh, that feed into the most uh, segregated uh, industries. You, Dr Simpson. Can I thank the Minister for that answer, but can I ask her if she shares my concern that some of the figures that have been received from a Freedom of Information request by my colleague Jackie Bailey, this shows that of 1,209 hairdressing students in training places in 2013, only 7% of those were men, despite some of the most famous hairdressers in the world being men. Uh, or is, she, is she also alarmed, as I am, that the engineering industry training programme is dominated by one gender, with only 3% of 3,671 training places taken up by females. And furthermore, in plumbing, which is one of the worst industries for female participation, with a rate in 2013 of less than 2%. Yes, I do share Mr uh, Simpson's concerns. Um, I'll just give, I suppose, one small caveat. It is also very important uh, that as well as encouraging uh, more women uh, into STEM, that we're also careful to ensure that we continue to value the work that women are traditionally uh, attracted to. Um, I'm certainly, uh, and this government's on record, is wanting to do more to get women into STEM, but also to get more men uh, into childcare. I think that's very important uh, in terms of uh, developing um, our, our children in, in terms of uh, uh, their needs. There is no easier quick answer uh, to this, uh, presiding officer. Um, occupational segregation is something that is reflected in the wider labour market. Uh, nonetheless, uh, we do wish to challenge it uh, and we do wish to, to, to change it. And that needs to start from the work we do with children in the early years and in our schools, all the way throughout our education and training system, and crucially, uh, also with the work uh, that we do uh, with em employers also. And the forthcoming uh, Wood Commission, the final report in a few weeks, um, I anticipate will have some important recommendations. Thank you very much. Jackson Carlo. Uh, to ask the Scottish Government whether it will develop appropriate outcome-based measures to assess the long-term benefits of modern apprenticeships as recommended by Audit Scotland. Secretary. Yes, a key achievement of our modern apprenticeship programme in Scotland is that 100% uh, of apprentices are and always have been employed. Um, and while undertaking an apprenticeship, the individual will obtain training and qualifications which will not only support them in their current role, but will also benefit for them in their future career. Uh, as we know, research from Skills Development Scotland shows that those who complete an apprenticeship, 92% are in work six months later and 79% are in full-time employment. However, we do appreciate that we can improve how we monitor uh, the long-term outcomes of the programme. Uh, we will consider how best to do this as we implement um, the recommendations from the recent Audit Scotland report, uh, along with the forthcoming Wood Commission report and also through Skills Development Scotland's ongoing evaluation activity. Uh, can, I, can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for her response on this, as she said earlier, a Scottish Apprenticeship Week. Um, and I know she's welcomed the Audit Scotland report. According to that report, the last time the Scottish Government published an explicit statement of its overall aim for modern apprenticeships was back in 2007. Since then, obviously, the economy has been through recession and rebalanced structurally. 
In order to reflect this and to better understand the long-term benefits of modern apprenticeships, as she was discussing there, Briefly. does the Cabinet Secretary believe the time is right to go beyond the annual ministerial guidance letter to Skills Development Scotland and develop a revised strategy that puts the qualitative before the quantitative? Cabinet Secretary. I think um, the objectives of the 2007 skills strategy uh, still stand in relation to the apprenticeship programme because it's about developing skills and work, particularly for uh, young people. Um, but it is important to recognise that we are about continuous improvement um, in this government and the Audit Scotland report acknowledged the tremendous successes of the apprenticeship programme during uh, a, a difficult time. But it is important, as we've learnt from other European countries uh, who have developed um, long-term uh, research and outcomes based um, in terms of getting a better grasp um, of the improved career opportunities uh, for young people who do apprenticeships and uh, the improved um, impact on businesses um, as well as the, the impact on the ind individual earnings uh, for young people. So there's certainly a lot we can learn um, from our uh, nearest friends and neighbours uh, in Europe in terms of getting a more holistic uh, understanding of the long-term impacts um, of our, our very uh, successful uh, Scottish apprenticeship programme. And my very final point, uh, presiding officer, is that uh, recent statistics show uh, that people with a modern apprenticeship qualification <laughs> have an employment rate of 91.4%. Thank you. Uh, that ends but follow questions. We now move to general questions. Question number one, Jamidi. Thank you, presiding officer. To ask the Scottish Government what